brought together 18 interdisciplinary undergraduate students to work intensively during the spring 2019 semester. Their goal was to A semester in alternate realities brought together 18 interdisciplinary undergraduate students to work intensively during the spring 2019 semester. Their goal was to develop and showcase virtual reality projects that portray meaningful experiences for the betterment of humanity and our planet. Over 13 weeks, the students utilized the agile development process for an adaptive and organized pipeline that incorporated the use of scrum boards, stand-up meetings, and iterative design. The semester included three public VR showcases with a focus on the final exhibition. The first two showcases each featured four projects created in small groups, while the third showcase focused on refining the four experiences from the second with no designated development collectives. As a beginning task, the class worked together to establish organization for the collective and consolidate feedback for necessary project adjustments moving forward. The large team continued developing the following four projects. Firstly, Aquatica takes you to our future, plastic-filled oceans, and tasks you with removing all organic life. Narrow walls, your consciousness is transformed into a digitized existence to travel far away from the pains of reality. Fit for You is a personalized fitness experience that caters to you based on your personal information. The final experience is Siege, where you are guided by your inner voice to defend the mind palace from intruders. During our final showcase, our aim was to not only present four solidified projects, but also to create a cohesive, overarching meta-narrative that links them all together, while not having to sacrifice the narrative of the individual projects by adjusting them in a way that fits in. As a collective, we decided we would present ourselves as a group from the future, one that is bleak and dystopian, who have come back to present simulated depictions of our timeline to be with the aim to induce a change of lifestyle and behavior in our participants ultimately putting the world on a new path and a different timeline. We noticed that all of the projects depicted dark themes in their own way and used that as inspiration for the meta-narrative that came to be. In the future we come from, the world has fallen into chaos due to carelessness for our environment, humans having destroyed the ocean, and loss of respect for the beings that reside within. We have willingly forsaken the value of personal data and information, giving it all to major corporations, and in result, giving them ultimate power and have yet again fallen into conflict, resulting in nuclear war and an uninhabitable Earth. Lastly, as one project covered the topic of loneliness, we wanted to end on a positive note by incorporating the idea of internal conflict resolution and placing an emphasis on the value of interpersonal relationships. The overall user experience and goal for the showcase was for users to have a deeper care for themselves and the world around them. One setback we experienced in our previous two showcases was long wait times and our time slots rapidly filling up. This created a bottleneck and unfortunately resulted in some interested participants not getting a chance to try the VR for themselves. A high priority goal this time around was to not only create a more exciting showcase, but also to optimize the flow of people and ensure everyone gets an opportunity to try at least one virtual reality experience. To do so, we designed a floor plan that afforded an event structure broken up into individual zones which our guests would go through. This featured a designated waiting area containing our previous projects designed for the Oculus Go. Additionally, we had a main area that encapsulated the current four projects in their individual sets that tied in with our meta-narrative. In this area, we had our project split in two paths to parallelize the participants going through. One path containing solely fit for you and another containing Aquatica and narrow walls, which would reconnect and end with Siege. Furthermore, we set up a post-experience zone with food and drinks, along with couches to conduct participant interviews and so that our guests could talk to one another about their experiences. Furthermore, we created an area for individual experiences that showcased the same main four projects. However, with each experience with its own designated lineup and without a physical set, so that guests who did not have the time to run through the structured narrative still had the opportunity to experience at least one of the projects. Did this experience bring up any feelings or thoughts about the sharing of your own data in your life? Definitely, definitely, yeah. Uh, when I click on like an update for an iPhone and they give you this massive list of things to read, nobody reads it. Um, and then nobody really has the time or is stubborn enough to read the whole thing. So you pretty much just might be selling your life away, right? You don't know. Is that something you thought about before today or is that new? It's before definitely, but the experience really brought it back and kind of reinforced it. 
I thought it was really well done. I came here expecting like playing tennis on VR, <laughs> you know, soccer with VR, and it, it was it had more depth. Didn't expect that at all. And I think it's important because technology is growing so fast, humanity is growing so fast, and before we know, we're going to lose control. We're going to lose control. And we won't. We might have people living in these realities, living other lives. You know, like like in that in the siege. You might have people living in alternate reality where they're happy in their little castle, or in in the fit for you. You know, uh, might be doing more harm to themselves that than they know of. Overall, based on the user feedback gathered and post experience interviews. We believe our goal to have people care more about themselves and the world around them has been achieved. Our agenda moving forward, yeah, this <laughs> Our agenda moving forward is that we a semester in alternate play the video again. <laughs> I pause it and then I'll speak again. And so what we are going to do today is we are going to ask our students to actually present for us, and Bernard will explain why in a moment. But after that, then we'd like to give those who wish to remain an experience of the four projects, which will be located in another room, but we'll all go down together to experience. So why do students speak first, Bernard? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, we care about the students. I mean, they are really the center. They are the reasons we're here. Without the students, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have our job. So we really wanted them to get the opportunity to go first and uh, present first. And then afterwards, we also talk a little bit about uh, our take on... Uh, so basically, first, you get to see the reality of what really happened. And then you hear about our thoughts on what we had in mind and what we really wanted to do. And then afterwards, uh, we'll have a bit of time for discussion, question and answer. And then we uh, all go down, uh, especially those who are interested in trying out the different VR demos. We have to set them up in a different room, uh, our classroom, actually. So you get to see our little classroom. And... Uh, so we'll probably have an hour or so to do demos, depending on how long it takes. And then afterwards, I think those interested, we might just hang out in the local group hub, which is about 30 meters away. Um, yeah. So um, instead of us talking more, let's have our students uh, present their take on what a semester in alternate realities we are for good, and so on and so on. Semester in Alternate Realities, or CR for short. You might be wondering what exactly that means, and fear not, I'm here to give you a very quick elevator pitch. So what you do is you take 18 students, all from very, very different backgrounds. Some people code, other people write, some people design, and others model. Then you trap them in a room from 9.30 to 5, every single day of the week, except for weekends, they're not monsters. Um, with not one, but two eccentric professors. Uh, and then you <laughs> wait and see what happens. Um, 
In all seriousness, though, uh, Bernard and Patrick, we believe that their aim throughout uh, the whole semester was to really push us to see how far we could take the technology of VR and what we could really communicate to users. So there's kind of an emphasis on, you know, escaping and entertainment when it comes to virtual reality. But they wanted us to kind of shift that focus and maybe focus on something like bettering the social good. So we hope that that is reflective in our projects that we will talk about. Um, so they kind of started off the semester by teaching us agile development, which most of us weren't uh, really familiar with. But basically, it's a bunch of methodologies um, for iterative design process um, and this works really well for all of us because of the way how um, it's kind of self-organized and it's really flexible so it adapts to how to our process. Um, so here you can see just um, how one of the students uh, for one of the teams drew out um, basically what our process looked like during one of the epics so one of our development processes leading, leading up to a showcase. Um, so our basic process, you took a whole bunch of people with different skills and uh, we got them all working together. So initially we were just grouped into four smaller teams and we, uh, so we had three showcases throughout the semester. So we started out in four smaller teams and as we kind of moved throughout the semester, we started just helping the other teams a little bit more as we felt more comfortable and trusted each other. Um, so we would have people helping write the narrative for other groups basically um, and things like that. So as we kind of moved through that and started trusting each other more, for the final showcase leading up to it, we ended up in what we refer to as the hive mind. So it was basically all 18 of us students working on four projects all together, not designated with any specific um, project. Um, so this opened things up quite a bit uh, because there were a lot more roles that we weren't used to having. So we had project managers for uh, a project manager for each individual project and the overall sort of collective as well as uh, set designers and things like that because we really managed the showcase leading up to it. Um, so it was really a really cool opportunity to get to try all of these other things that often happen kind of behind the scenes or somebody has to do but you don't really realize that it happens. So uh, this was kind of a big challenge that was put in front of us but because we all trust each other and really cared about our projects it worked really well for us. Um, so then we'll just go a little bit more into depth into the final four projects that we presented at our showcase. So that's Fit For You, Narrow Walls, Aquatica, and Siege. Fit For You is an application that masquerades itself as your typical fitness app. Uh, what we do with users is we kind of preface the whole experience by telling them that because this is more of a physical app, we are very thorough with our information. So we ask them things like, how often in the day are you sedentary? Um, how many calories do you eat? Uh, what kind of drugs do you take? So on and so forth. Uh, and then uh, we advise them that the reason we do this is because we uh, actually have a yoga session that happens within the VR experience that is led by a personal trainer. And uh, we just want to make sure that the experience is catered to their uh, comfort level. In actuality, though, what we do is we take all of the data that they have given us at the beginning and also uh, we find as much data as possible online based off of their name, their phone number, and their email, which they so graciously provided us at the beginning. And then we start what we like to call the data breach. So the data breach happens right in the middle of the yoga session and the user is confronted with all of their information that we have found. Uh, this is actually to prove a point about cybersecurity, you know, kind of proving the point that we readily give away our information without really thinking about where it goes, who has it, and what can be done with it. What we do with this project is we kind of hypothesize what would happen if uh, a fitness app stole your information and then started selling it uh, in order to gain profit. And then we kind of see how people react to this because we kind of unknowingly do it all the time. Um, so in terms of process, the first iteration, we showed users the breach and then we took them back to the yoga experience and then we acted as if nothing happened just to kind of mimic how corporations handle data breaches. Like, oh, no, no, it's fine. What data breach? But uh, we kind of realized that the user felt like sort of a victim. You know, they didn't really have a lot of agency. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to empower users, not so much make them scared. 
So in our second iteration, what we do is we give them a choice. You can either keep your data or you can delete it. And then we have consequences depending on each choice that is made. And so our next experience was Narrow Walls, which was a narrative-driven VR experience in which the user was the survivor of a fictional depiction of World War III. And so to kind of seek refuge uh, from that, the user would attempt to upload their consciousness into the virtual realm to kind of escape the bleakness uh, of this fictional reality. And so a core of the experience is the user will be in a very dark uh, area, uh, an area where there's tons of darkness and their surroundings aren't very perceivable. And in this environment, there would be virtual characters that would interact with each other and kind of talk about their background and what their lives were like for the war. Uh, and while this is all happening, there's a counter that kind of counts down how much progress their consciousness has been uploaded into the virtual realm. Ultimately, we wanted users to walk away with this experience with a greater empathy for people like refugees who might find themselves displaced uh, due to uh, war or any other uh, political situations that might be happening from where they're from. Yeah. And so our next project is Aquatica, which is a satirical account of the future, what it would be like if due to overfishing and an abundance of plastics in the ocean, uh, the world kind of had a switched perception of natural beauty, which was the ocean filled with plastics, that's beautiful. No organics. And so the user then is hired by this, aquatic, this company called Aquatica, and in it, they're tasked with exterminating all organics that they find in the ocean. And so in an environment like this, you'll see there are plastic bags floating in the ocean, opposed to something like a group of jellyfish. And throughout the experience, the user can choose to exterminate much of the organic life that they see in the ocean, whether that's sea cucumbers and fish. And if they do so, they get hired by the company. Otherwise, if they choose not to, their experience ends and they'll be asked to take out the headset and they won't be hired by the company. But ultimately, uh, our goal with this experience was to have users walk away with a greater awareness of what their actions have in regards to how they get rid of uh, their plastics and how that can affect the ecosystem of the ocean. All right, uh, so Siege is the project that tackles a little bit something, something different. It's about the internal turmoil that happens in your consciousness and in your mind. It's actually a problem that I think it's kind of covers like the eternity of the human kind of life and history. It's the social isolation. It's the issue that, for example, I felt when I came to this country for the first time as, a, as, a, as an international student, because like it's this moment when you feel like you're left out. And maybe, just maybe, some people would think, oh, you know, now I'll turn aggressive. Now I'll be pushing away people from my life because I don't trust them anymore. And this is exactly the, uh, the topic we decided to cover with this project, is this feeling of like people who pushing away other people, socially isolated people, but who sometimes maybe need a little more encouragement to get to understand that maybe they should maintain their relationships a little bit more. So how do we decide to go about this problem? How do we imagine it or picture it? We've decided to put our users in the mindset of an isolated individual who's having a conversation with his own uh, consciousness. And this consciousness is keep pushing things away. They're defending their own mind castle from the intruders, from the attack, which in fact is an attack at all. Because sometimes, all of, like, of all these paper planes that are coming through, there are messages from people, from their friends, who are trying to reach them. But the consciousness is still trying to push them away until the attack intensifies and then consciousness gives up. So in the very end of the experience, users are given the chance to reconnect and throw the paper plane back uh, to their friends. And we're going to show a small video that better describes the project. Siege is a virtual reality experience for the Oculus Rift headset that aims to show users the value of connection with other people and maintaining strong relationships. Through simple gameplay, extended metaphor, and an immersive environment, the user is able to understand this theme of community and connectivity to bring it forward into their own lives. In the pre-experience, the user approaches a castle made out of cardboard. 
they are prompted to enter the Mind Palace and put on the headset. In VR, the user finds themselves in a throne room where they are introduced to their inner voice. Suddenly, a commotion is heard outside and the inner voice asks the user to help investigate. The user is then taken to the castle tower, where they can see that the castle is being bombarded with paper airplanes. Equipped with a fan, they are asked to deflect them away from the palace. However, some of the airplanes contain messages from a friend. Hey, how's it going? The inner voice begins responding to the messages, which ultimately leads to the user throwing a paper airplane back, which symbolizes reconnection. In the post experience, the user is given a paper airplane as a memento. Inside the paper airplane is a poem about connection. The use of VR over other mediums allows us to explore extended metaphor in an embodied way and lets users explore physically concepts that could previously only be imagined. As such, the experience evokes both imaginative immersion through the metaphor and storyline, as well as sensory immersion through the environment, the interaction of the battle, and the feedback from the controller. Our development used agile processes and iterative design to refine our core and improve with every prototype. This meant using a scrum board to keep up with every member of the team and stay on track. The main shift in our development was the change in how the cores communicated to the user from viewing a narrative to experiencing it themselves. Additionally, the way in which we explore isolation and reconnection changed from a very specific storyline to a much broader metaphor that let the user draw their own conclusions and relate it back to their own relationships. Initial user tests found this execution to be much stronger, so the team quickly adapted and modified our prototype based on this feedback to make an all-around more powerful experience. Overall, after several iterations of our prototype, users connected to the storyline and walked away with a meaningful experience they could carry forward into their own lives. We may see that uh, all those four projects are hard to connect. However, our collective decided to create an overarching narrative, which will speak from the uh, side of people who are from future, and will describe to those people who are living now what the future may be if we don't take action. In our team, within our team, we call this narrative a meta narrative, and uh, what it does, it uh, tells the story of the future from another side, from the bad side. We amplify the uh, bad parts of the future where people are using plastic, where there is a lot of war and they need to run away from their country, or where they need to encapsulate themselves all the time and do not communicate with people who surround them. For our final public showcase, we created uh, four different book, books that represented each project and helped people to immerse themselves prior to experiencing VR. It helped us in many ways to guide the participants and uh, to provide them with necessary information about each project. During the showcase, uh, we, designed a, we, we designed different parts where people could go through the whole experience, having the pre-immersion and post-immersion, and we designed the uh, kind of, we call them fast lanes, or just standalone experiences, where people could just go and see what VR is. Our main goal that we tried to achieve is, was to give people hope that VR and all those technological booms, they are for good, not to hurt anyone, and uh, to make a desired shift in everyone's mind. So, as, previous, as previously mentioned, uh, all of our projects centered around the theme of VR for good. Uh, so, we didn't really talk about what that kind of looks like specifically. Um, we can start with the good. So, Bernard and Patrick, had this interesting way of motivating us in order to create these projects. <laughs> um, no, don't worry. This this one's nice. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about the other stuff. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. That's for later. Um, so they actually started out each uh, project 
iteration by asking us, what do we care about? And then they didn't stop there, they asked us, why? So that actually really helped in terms of, first of all, we were excited to work on what we wanted to work on. But the why really helped us kind of hone in on why these issues were important and what we wanted to communicate to people. Because of this process, every single time we worked on a project, we were all motivated, we were all excited, and we really, really wanted the, the, the project to end very, very, very well. Um, so that was the good, but the bad is kind of, it's a little bit more difficult to describe. So at first, we didn't really know what we were getting into with VR. We kind of heard that it was a new emerging technology and that it could be dangerous, but we didn't really know why. So we started by talking about the surface level issues of you know, cyber sickness, how to avoid that, you know, how to design for it. But then we started talking about the ethics behind VR and what it could do to people, not only on a physical, physical level, but also a cognitive one. Um, and once we started getting into you know, how dangerous it could be and how much people could be affected by this technology, that really helped us make all of our design decisions. Um, it really informed all of our UX decisions, our visuals, and uh, even the concepts and narratives uh, were kind of treated with that extra special care just because this is new developing technology. And we wanted to leave a lasting impression that was good on people who were new to it. Um, and to kind of talk about the theme, at first, at least for me, I'll be honest, I thought it was going to be a little bit limiting. But it was kind of touched upon in uh, our meta narrative video where someone said it ended up being so much more purposeful than they thought. And that's actually what happened for a lot of students in the class. You know, we all kind of came in wanting to make games. And then as it progressed, we realized that you can make so much more purposeful decisions and more meaningful um, experiences that really, you know, um, kind of affect people in different ways, more intensely than they could in any other medium. And that's kind of what we took away from that. So um, as a final uh, sort of abode, uh, right now not all of our uh, students are here, but the ones that are, if you would like to rise, just because you weren't up here, but you were equally as important. So. Uh, we'd like to offer about five or so minutes, however much time we have remaining, for any questions. Any at all? Cool. Patrick. You can think of tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> we feel like we asked already enough questions. <laughs> or if, I think you feel that we asked more than enough questions. Uh, yes, I, so you mentioned that you, you had the question why I asked. Um, was this why question also extended to the medium itself? Why are you using VR for this purpose? So I'm just going to repeat the question for the recorder. Uh, so Saeed asked uh, or mentioned that we, the students asked why a lot, and he's asking if they were also tasked to ask why VR or to solve a particular problem or tell a particular story? And the answer to that would be yes, a lot. <laughs> all yes. Every single all thing time. that we did, like, we would present for what one of our projects, what we thought that, yeah, a project we wanted to do, and they would say, well, why couldn't you just, you could just make a video, it'll work just as well, like, why would you use VR for this? They always kind of, like, sort of challenged us with it, so why VR was a, one of the big so questions that was asked a lot. It's one <laughs> um, of the big cornerstones of what we developed and how we developed it. And it helped us to realize why actually we need to use VR to communicate the idea of how we can use this action on the user. So through the iterative process, we've created all those amazing experiences. But it all occurred because we because we were actually asking ourselves each day, every time, every minute, why VR, why are we not doing 360, why we can just do a 2D game and then leave it like it is. It's all worked out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Any harder questions? <laughs> sure, I'll ask them, right? So instead of why, how, how do you guys balance like the balance between having a narrative that you just watch in 3D and something that's just simply a game with no deeper me message in it? So how do you balance those two ends? 
So could you try to repeat the question for the recording? Tough <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, I, I know the answer for it, but I don't know how to phrase it correctly. Um, uh, the answer for this one would be, we always rely, we have specific people in our class who are responsible for co-use experience, so that we can make the desired shift on the user. And uh, whenever we were create, creating or coming up with crazy ideas, we would always have someone who would drag us down and say if it aligns or not with the core user experience. So with that in mind, we need to balance out the gamification of the idea and the actual uh, concept itself to give the user both entertainment and change their mindset towards a better group. So what uh, I'm sure during your ideation process or throughout the whole process is probably ideas that came out that were much longer term, right? So otherwise this would be semesters in alternate realities, right? So what, what's next then? Like what's next? What, what are some of the things that could come out of this that is it a, a different narrative? Is it, is it a stronger message? Is it continuing along the same four things? And then you know, what, what's next, basically? Um, so your question was, uh, how, uh, what's next? What's the next step in how we uh, approach VR from here, right? Yes. Um, so a lot of our stuff has environmental uh, applications. So we can go. Um, so a realistic step is to market it next. But um, for us, the next step is to move on to an independent game platform, itch.io, and share our creations with a wider community, and hopefully gain traction through that. Yeah, so some of us are actually continuing with directed studies to help develop some of their other um, projects. So just use the skills that we've developed to help make more like good VR experiences. Um, and then with the actual ones that we've made, we hope to improve them a little bit more and kind of like take in some of the user feedback that we got from the showcase and um, then, yeah, uh, publish them in some sort of way, hopefully, for some of them. Share them more, basically. Say that uh, I'd like to add on that in future, for us being taught by Patrick and Bernard, there is an insane difference uh, with people who are developing for VR with no knowledge about it. Because recently, as I began actually going through each of the VR projects that we find on each Inch.io or Kickstarter or Indiegogo or Steam, and what people do, they they don't realize the potentials of VR and they don't know the mechanics. So they adapt the 3D game, for example, to VR, where you need to, I don't know, raise uh, on the on the pipe. It, it gives you motion sickness, and it doesn't make a desired shift. We might think it is a game, but it also, like, it is a game in VR. Being taught and actually understanding how VR works, I hope most of us will proceed working in VR and creating amazing content for people to develop the even further. All right, well, let's give them a hand. Oh, you got a question. Okay, one more. Um, I was just wondering, uh, we, you mentioned something around, along uh, the hive mind. So what did that look like in practice? Maybe uh, you guys can also like, speak to it. Um, so it started out that they were saying, like, oh, we'll do this hive mind. And we didn't really know what that meant. Exactly. We basically just knew it was going to be all of us working together on four projects, but we weren't really sure how to organize it at all. Um, but at first, when they told us, like, okay, we're going to be starting on this soon, we were kind of like, what do we do? Like, what's the first step? We didn't really know. So the way, at the beginning of the semester, we made, like, a little skill sheet to say, like, oh, what we're good at, what we can teach other people, what we kind of want to, like, learn more about. And they ended up adding to it, Patrick and Bernard, uh, saying, identifying some skills that we can help contribute to the overall hive mind, and we also discussed it with others. Um, and they just kind of, they suggested roles um, that we could do. So we established first um, four project managers for each of them who weren't um, stuck on those projects specifically, but just had to make sure that the tasks were getting done. And then we also had four uh, core people. Yeah, yeah, because of the core, yeah. 
So those four people uh, were basically the person that if you wanted to propose like a change or something or something that was a little bit major, you needed to kind of make sure that was or that was the person you could check in with to be like, hey, does this make sense to do? Uh, and they would basically just judge like if we were it was keeping it on track because things could kind of get a little jumbled if it's a lot of people. Um, and then starting into it, when we actually started development, we looked at we did keep fix change. So we looked at what we wanted to adapt about our projects because we did continue with ones that we previously had. We kept the cores and just modified them. We basically ended up just modifying the narratives a little bit and fixing some bugs and then going into how we could just strengthen the experiences overall. And that's where we kind of split up and identified the tasks that we needed to do, like more 3D modeling or adjusting the narrative, audio recording, things like that. And we went into the tasks and people would identify that others needed help or um, they needed someone else and people would reach out or volunteer and that's basically like how the projects came to be is just all of us working all together using our skills to make all the four projects. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Technology. Yeah. So thanks to the students who presented and also to the rest of the cohort for helping put that presentation together and for all their hard work in the semester. While Bernard is setting up, I'll just give you a little bit of a context of what we're going to present on, which will probably be short, uh, because what we're interested in telling you the story of is how we came to design this course that we did and how we adopted a lot of principles of agile and iterative design and iterative change to our design of instruction that we did in cycles. And those cycles were large cycles, uh, basically per epic. So we had three epics, an agile speaky term for a, a particular uh, phase of a project that you want to co-construct with others. We reduced those to weekly sprints, and then we reduced those to daily uh, sprints for Bernard and I. So overall, what we're going to tell you is the story of why that transpired the way it did, and also how we achieved that. So once Bernard is set, I will intro for him to begin and give him a sneaky keyword <laughs> that none of you know. Including Bernard? Including myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's typically what happens if you present together. You just uh, have no idea what's going to happen here. OK, let me just try and see where I can get this okay. set up. Is it, is so it it's, it's all because some dongles uh, between HDMI and uh, Thunderbird and so on is as usual not. Um, while I'm setting this up, we should also thank all the people who made this course possible. I mean, this is uh, quite... Uh, it's a long list, yeah. It, it's a long list. Uh, there's definitely on uh, the SFU side, uh, foremost our dean, Aoife, who really believed in the idea and really allowed us to, to go there the semester dialogue. A lot of administration, IT, facilities, security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a few good conversations that, that were really amazingly helpful. And a lot of other people, UBC as well, now uh, uh, for allowing Patrick to co-teach. I think this might be one of the first courses that I actually taught between two faculty members of different universities here. We also need to mention a special thank you to uh, Barb, who's in the room, right oh, there, there she is. Out, who really did this. It was really an integral process for Bernard and I from the beginning, back last year, in terms of the development of what the students experienced. So anything good that you experienced that came out of the course, you can just blame it on Barb. All so she's an educational consultant. Maybe mean, everybody should have their own educational consultant. <laughs> All right. I, think I don't think we have this. Oh, we don't have this. Do you want the keyword to begin? Oh, yeah. Do, do you get a keyword? Yeah. Okay. Start. <laughs> <laughs> Press start to the end here. Okay. So, oh, I think it's meant to be black. So when you teach a course on VR, you can't help but ask yourself, like, OK, why yet another course in VR? I mean, if you look on Google, there's gazillions of like 60 million results if you cr uh, just Google for videos on creating virtual reality. I'm not sure whether it's really 60 million, but there's a lot. There's a lot of really uh, good tutorials. There's 
a lot of books as well uh, on doing this. Uh, if you look at Amazon, there's like uh, 6,000 books. Uh, there's online courses, gazillions. So now if we have the honor of really having actual real non-Android students in a physical classroom, how can we really take advantage of this? How can you make this worth them actually coming out to Surrey? A lot of people don't live here. Um, so we ask ourselves a couple of different questions and it often started with a what if really. Like what if we would teach a course together? Now this started and it was all Bernard's fault because he dragged me into saying, oh, it's not going to take much of your time, Patrick. So <laughs> we talk this little I tiny little VR class, class together. And then the, and the what if tool is also a design thinking tool that we brought to our students as well. So what if we co-taught a VR course that had a purpose? You know, not just a VR course, but you know, like maybe okay. VR for dummies, so, so VR for... So, you mean, so we would actually care about the course? Yeah, we, <laughs> VR for caring. That for was caring. Yeah. 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 What's also clear is, like, what if we really cared about the course? How do we design a course so we care about the students? I mean, we do, but even more. That's a good one. I like that. I just want to pause. Okay, I thought I'm pause. Yeah, and, and so to build on that, we kept asking what if questions. What if we were to do a course that constantly changed every day? Because we didn't know who was going to be in the room. And yeah, we can plan out whatever we want to plan out over the course of weeks, months, a semester. We can have perfectly laid out plans that are disastrous the first day, which is actually what happened. So we asked ourselves, what if we were able to shift and change what we did based on what the students gave to us. So what if we would not only teach Agile, but really embrace it ourselves? Mm -hmm. So what if we are actually there in the moment and really try, try really hard to listen and empathize and understand what our students really need and want, what their challenges are, and drop our egos and lessons plans and slides <laughs> and uh, in the middle so we typically in the morning we have a break in the middle walk over to the coffee machine and like okay let's just grab the whole plan and do something completely different because i think that would work better what if what we if didn't tell that to the students so they didn't know that that's what we did well, at least <laughs> not right, at least not right away okay that's right. what if we co-teach, not in the classical model where you're like, oh yeah, uh, you take this part, I take the other. No, we actually show up together oh, yeah. in the classroom without scripting it. There's no way Patrick can be scripted anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I'm following a precise one now, but yeah, it's been, it was hard to memorize. <laughs> <laughs> so what if we uh, try to ask SFU to have a room 24-7 for this semester? What if we really try to intentionally bother security? <laughs> okay, that wasn't the intention. That was an intention. That was an phenomenon. That was emerging. Yeah. What if you got people from different departments together? So it's not just not just CS, not just computer science, not just whatever department. But what happens if you really put them together? Because that's real life. And one of the final what ifs that will lead into the next section is: What if we tried our best to design a course? that incorporated all of these ideas. This is where, I actually stole this from Barb because every time she met with us at the end, because we also inspire each other for so many gazillions of ideas, and then she would always go. <laughs> yeah. And what if you dare to be authentic in the classroom? So we don't try to behind, hide behind us all and the prof or whatever that is. Uh, for say, but really try and be there and uh, allow the students to really ask us hard questions, to question us, allow in real time my co-teacher, allow each other to really challenge ourselves. And often we, we did not agree. No, not agree, not agree. Okay. So I don't agree with that, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what if we really try to take the for good as a theme, not just for the students to create for good projects, but try to create a course that somehow has this element so we all care more about it. What if Farhad then joined us on this? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> no, it's all good. Yeah. What? Thank you. <laughs> so, so our integration of all these elements inspired an overall semester structure that you can see here. And as you see, there was a lot. So this was the initial idea. Shift a little bit because we wanted to have three different projects, epics. Because when we listen to the students in previous classes, often they do all the main project in the end, and then they write this long documentation. And if you really listen to them, they tell you, um, you know, nobody's reading it. They're just grading it. They're just marking it. What if we actually do one project within the first five weeks, and afterwards we take a whole week to just reflect on what happened, how we could improve this? So we have a first showcase here. There we go. And then do the same thing again, but in different teams. So they get to really try and experience what it's really like to be in a different team and start from scratch again, basically have the opportunity to really start from scratch. Okay. Yes, there's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> you rehearsed this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh boy, so last night, oh, no. I'm sending Bernard all of these loopy loops. Because I couldn't help it. We've been in this. We've been talking about feedback loops a lot, and uh, we're we're actually designing a, a keynote that we were volunteered to do for a cybernetics <laughs> conference. And so I wanted to give a perspective of, uh, and and perhaps with Bernard model this. But this is the standard teaching learning loop, and it's actually not really a loop. But it's not a loop. Transmission. This is transmission model, as Bernard mentions. But this is what we did not want be clear. And this is what both Bernard and I and many people in the room have experienced, right? I teach, you learn. Cool, I'm going to go now. We'll see you tomorrow. Where I'm going to teach, you're going to learn. And then I'm going to go away again. And then tomorrow, I'm going to teach and you're going to learn. And so on and so on and so on. And, and perhaps before, because we've done it for centuries. Yeah. It must work, right? Well, you for a century. I haven't done it for that. So next up, we have the kind of feedback loop which actually transpired. And so when I was describing this to Bernard uh, over the phone, there were lots of question marks. But in this one, I'm teaching. You're learning. But then your response to me and my listening to you is also me learning from what you are teaching. And so this was more the reality of what we try to facilitate. I'd say with various successes and not so successes, especially being in an academic environment where we, at the end of the day, have to assess, which is the part most of us as uh, teachers hate. Right? I think the students as well, to yeah. some degree. <laughs> yeah. This also happens to be the course where I got asked the least about grades and marks and how we actually evaluate people, which is impressive. So what we really would like to do is this illustration of how do we really bring this together? Because it's really a joint teaching learning environment. So uh, we learn from the students, we learn from each other in that moment and by constantly listening. So the next slide is really, in, is really similar, but it's, this slide is really about transforming the roles. So I become teacher, but I also become learner, just as you as learners also become the teachers. So that's, so, but it requires a, a, a little bit of a shift. We have to actually embody that and believe it. So we're no longer the people who, who have the book, uh, like the only handwritten book like 500 years ago, so it makes sense to lecture from it. So we felt we're more like coaches, mentors. I think we are called old, weird old uncles. <laughs> 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 I think the idea of a Yoda <laughs> somehow came up. Sometimes uh, we were called, no, we called each other dogs. <laughs> um, so a, lo a lot of that uh, ability to reinvent role and to reinvent this process of learning and teaching from each other uh, had to do with a tool which I don't think many of us consider to be a strategic tool, but that strategic tool was reflection. In our case, we didn't just say, hey guys, hey, reflect, and then walk away. We felt it was important to give structured reflections. 
So, and so now the, the students can understand now that's where that came from. And at the beginning, at least for most of the course, it was daily, where we would ask students to reflect on what they learned. And we learned from that reflection. Well, we also, the interesting part is if you have a co-instructor that you spend a lot of time with at every SkyTrain together, uh, <laughs> you cannot help but really think about it and get questions. Uh, and what was interesting is also that the student uh, started questioning us and we're like, well, why, what if we would shift the deadline like over here because I think that would work better. So there, there's a lot of feedback there as well. And if it made sense, we're like, Sure. There's so some Patrick way. designed these uh, blobs and arrows, so I always <laughs> let him go first on these ones. But this is just exactly what Bernard said. Oh, what I said earlier. We taught something, students responded to what we were teaching, and we changed what we taught based on those responses. Yeah, eventually we thought, oh, wait, let's do like a weekly reflection and so on, and then it became daily, and then in the break in the Hourly. morning it was like, well, we walked in, and while the students were writing their daily reflection, we took like, Patrick, let's go out and talk for a moment. And then we came back uh, with the next idea. So the time course of the iteration reflection kind of condensed, and in the end it was almost immediate. Can I ask a very good question? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, we're not finished the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, you made a choice not to be fully open and actually discuss your innermost thoughts of between each other in front of the students. I'm curious what motivated you to do that. Which innermost thoughts? So you would step outside while they were reflecting and have a private conversation and bring that the decisions that you made back in. Um, oh, to be, to oh, yeah, that was more to do with what was going to happen next. Yeah. Don't worry. So that's when we happen. designed the next activity sometimes, or adjusted the activity, and we, no, we felt like... Didn't you have that essentially that discussion openly, loudly, in front well, of the students? Oh, okay. then, did we? Um, I feel like probably just because if they would start trying to discuss it, we would kind of butt in and like make it a big discussion, and then it'd be way harder and more complicated and take longer. So if they just step out for a minute, like talk about it, and then come back, like, hey, this is their idea, then we can yell at them if we don't like it. And then, you know, but, <laughs> no, but sometimes they did. Like, yeah, sometimes close, they did. Yeah, close too. to the end of the semester, they'd be like, Bernard would be like, oh, okay, so we're going to do this next, and then Patrick would be like, <laughs> okay, so did yeah. you prefer openness or did you prefer them to have more of a script? Uh, I think at the beginning, I think they did right at the beginning because like, that would have been overwhelming. We would have been like, we have no idea what's going on. Yeah. But like, like to the it end. was almost impossible to notice when Bernard and Patrick were not present in the class. The presence of them in, in the class, so it wasn't a, a huge yeah. problem. They were always in the class. I mean, I don't know, probably their soul and their mind was there, but like, it was, it felt okay. It was nice. I think I like the way I perceived it. It was just as the semester went on, just the mutual trust that it grew between us as students and I, I would say facilitators instead of professors. Um, so at the start of the semester, it was very much like you were saying, you would step out, you'd be planned, come back, and we go off that. But as the semester progressed, uh, it would be more open, like, hey, we're going to go do this. And if we had concerns or problems with that, we'd be able to speak our minds okay. and actually so justify as to why. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> also, we, we wanted to take into consideration that we're trying uh, out something that's quite new, and we have no idea whether it's going to work or not, mm -hmm. really, because we right. have tried it out. So we didn't want to to let people know the extent of the agility of our teaching approach. So we always had a written uh, version of the plan for the day and so on. It just changed really quickly sometimes. So this map is basically what we went through on a daily basis. The important one is here. We reflected on the student reflection for us. Because otherwise, why would we ask them to reflect if we were to actually read those reflections, take them in, and have that inform uh, design decisions for the next day. And sometimes you don't even need to ask for official reflection, you just kind of listen in and you try to be present and notice, okay, what, what's really going on? And the more we went along the semester, the students were a lot, became a lot more direct and vocal in terms of demanding or asking or suggesting things, which it might be 
challenging initially, but in a way we really liked it because that's it's kind of user feedback. That's agile. We get direct feedback from the people to help us improve uh, the system because we know it's not perfect. Of course not. I mean, it, it's an iterative prototype of a course, and we are right now at the end of the first prototype of the first very first iteration of this. But we, we have probably I don't know how many examples of feedback surveys. So oh, all of that, yeah, so we were going to introduce this process that we went through as our SkyTrain Scrum. <laughs> because really, we had 32 minutes from commercial and Broadway, or was it was yeah, a less so, than that? So I always uh, started a, a station early. I cycled to Science Gold, and then he got on uh, commercial drive. And that was our daily ritual, almost, mm -hmm. to really go through this. You missed one where, if I was there early, I would persistently text him as to where he was. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> even though I knew he was on a bike, I'd still text him. <laughs> <laughs> so fortunately, I didn't really hear it because in backpack in my. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, SkyTrain Scrum. Um, I think that'll make a good article. Maybe mm -hmm. we should write the Sky SkyTrain Scrum. Yeah, uh, the only suggestion is don't don't stand up for the Scrum like you normally do if you're on the SkyTrain. That just doesn't really work well. <laughs> um, and yeah, the students showed you one map of the, the Agile maps that they co-constructed. And this is another example of it. And this one was uh, is similar to the process we went through. And we thought we'd show this also because it was kind of transit-like. <laughs> yeah. So for us, there was a lot of ideation and trying and testing, and then weekly and daily. And there, there's a lot of even smaller uh, cycles in there. The only difference, it's, uh, it's not like you launch at the end. Uh, you operate live in real time, which is quite different than uh, launching it to the public. It was always in front of the public. Like sometimes we went outside for five minutes to discuss, or sometimes ten if you needed more. And sometimes the students might have noticed, oh, that was a long coffee break. Sometimes that was before because we either needed a lot of coffee or uh, we took a bit more time to design this. Um, so how do we know it actually worked? What do we know? We have some stats. Yeah. So we saw the Slack group, and so I think we have uh, at least a dozen Slack channels now. So I found, uh, we asked them for these daily reflections. It ended up not being daily, maybe like every other day or so on. So we have about at least 34,000 words. At least the, those are the ones that I downloaded and uh, counted. Uh, we have <laughs> numerous <laughs> amounts of <laughs> pictures and documentation and gazillions of this. Uh, I ran out of space both on Google Drive and on SFU Vault uh, for this. Um, we uh, used a lot of just-in-time teaching responses. So, so that's when we ask the students where they stand we, if they do a reading. We ask them to reflect on it because we wanted to see where they stand. Uh, they wrote a lot. We also uh, did various versions of uh, VR design documents. Uh, so for each epic, uh, there were four different ones for four projects. And so there were about 30,000 words per epic. So also quite a bit of different one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we, needed, oh, yeah. we needed to be in really, really good terms with security. And so uh, in the first week or two, I got several messages like, Oh, something happened on campus. Or like people doing this activity without official authorization. Here's the authorization <laughs> form if you want to do this in the mezzanine. <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But the, the more we got to know security better, uh, they were actually really nice and supportive. This one time they came to like, you know, it's the directors, like campus director, is right over there. So you might want to tone it down a little bit. <laughs> I, I later heard that they did hear it. <laughs> um, yeah, so the students did hear it. We have a quote later that involves wood. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what did the students, I mean, you heard from the students ourselves. Um, so we got permission to share these, uh, uh, some of these quotes. The most unique and engaging semester I've had at my university career so far. I'm not going to read the next one because it's too long. Okay. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to learn new skills, make new friends, comma, and work with technology for the greater good. 
<laughs> the most intensive <coughs> course at SFU where students get uh, hands-on experience with cutting-edge technology. I actually know everybody's name. Although I did test someone yesterday. Yeah, that's yeah. Robert. 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 Yeah, Robert. Yeah, Robert. Uh, <laughs> that's not just for the students. I think this is the first uh, course ever where in the first week I knew all the names. Like that mm -hmm. doesn't happen to me normally. <laughs> It's a unique experience where the class actually feels like a community. The most intensive course at SFU ever. We already said that. We had this before. You just really like that one. He slightly passed him, so he survived. No one was injured in the making of our showcase. No, that's good. We're thinking of that as a good media. So. <laughs> what is, we try to use virtual reality not as the goal, but as a vehicle really to help students care about themselves, about each other, about their teams, or their community. And I mean, what if we could go broader with that? What if we could do this together with UBC? Uh, what if we really bring, we use this as a way to really bring together the different communities, the different disciplines? And with that, we finish. Thanks to all the amazing students, of course Patrick, and everybody else, uh, without whom this would never have been possible. So it's, it's really interesting. So the original vision started probably about almost two years ago, and I could not have imagined how amazing the class is. And even though it was exhausting for, I think, all of us, I think the <laughs> excitement and the enthusiasm and, yeah, the community really made this all work together. So we have time for no questions. And let's go play with some VR. Unless you have burning questions. Wow, I did a good job. <laughs> so why don't we go downstairs uh, to experience some of the VR projects that the team made. So you might not all fit in the elevator. It's in room 2710. So maybe a few of the students can hang out in the mezzanine and collect people. Uh, uh, if, uh, maybe Patrick can do that. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I, I, I've tried to go get a present for myself. Oh, convenient. What? <laughs> <laughs>